Will, welcome back to Talk Python to me. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's fantastic to have you here. Really looking forward to talking about the progress you've made on Rich and Textual and your company, which is pretty fantastic. The show is not specifically about that. It's more about all these fantastic lessons that you've learned while mm. building it. But, you know, of course, we'll get a chance to talk about it and, and give some updates too, I'm sure. Cool. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> normally I ask folks what how they got into programming and, and whatnot. And people, if they want to hear that story, they can go back and check out your episode 336 on Talk Python way back, way back last year, about a year ago. It's a lifetime but ago. How, so much has happened. I know. It, it, <laughs> in terms of what's happened with this, your projects and stuff, it really is kind of a lifetime ago. So what I want to ask you instead is, you know, what have you been up to the last year? Give us an update. Yeah. Um, okay. So I founded textualize.io um a new new startup um i've hired developers and we're very busy working on on textual and it's come on really well it's it's amazing does more than i thought it would do to be honest with you oh uh, textualize.io <laughs> <laughs> yeah textualize there we go uh the other one's for sale if you want it <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I get that all the time. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So you've been working on Textualize and uh, you actually got some investments and you're, you're hiring and amazing. I'm, I'm mm. so happy for you. Thank you. Yeah. It was, um... and yet when I first heard that, I'm like, well, what is the business model? What is the business model here? Like, what are you all working towards? Like, yeah, really I've, I've... To just leverage the terminal, right? Even more. Um, yeah, that's right. So that's a very reasonable question that everyone asks. Um, so the first part, is textual, which will be open source um, and distributed just like any other open source project. Um, but we will add on this uh, a commercial service where you can take those textual apps and then you can put them in the web. And then when they're on the web, we can charge uh, companies and organizations um, uh, a monthly fee for various services uh, such as uh, accounts and things and maybe mm -hmm. you know payment portals and things. But there will be a very generous uh, free tier for for hobbyists and for open source projects that want to do the same fantastic so we have SaaS for software as a service we have pass mm. p-a-a-s for platform as a service and the whole style of apps from textual and to a lesser degree rich uh, often go under the terminology of tui a text mm. user interface right so TUI as a service, TAS, T A S. Yeah. Are you creating that, a new new uh, <laughs> as a service? Yeah, I, I kind of like it. Um, TAS. You get, um, you know, in tech we love our acronyms. So if I don't invent at least one, I'll be disappointed. And, that's uh, right. That's yeah. right. And if they can have like you know multiple uh, cases, right? Like a capital T A S, then I think it's, mm. it's gonna be great. Yeah, it's it's an even yeah. it's one of the better types of acronyms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, I think this is great. And, you know, there's one of the things I'm really fascinated about and for a long time I've been trying to pay attention to and highlight is how do people go from open source project to business? And when I first started the podcast and really started to think about these things, it seemed like there was not that many great answers. It felt like a, a mm -hmm. lot of, well, here's my PayPal donation link or something. Yeah, And it just seemed like, well, okay, that might feel good as a thanks, but you cannot make that your job to say, buy me a coffee most yeah. of the time. <laughs> there but is, um, there's, a, there's a lot of progress lately, isn't mm -hmm. there? Uh, yeah, from uh, GitHub sponsors and similar programs, mm -hmm. um, you can um, get sponsorship and it can be enough to, to live on. Um, it's not easy. And the type of projects that get sponsored are the ones which are uh, super critical to businesses. And in that case, companies don't mind donating uh, $300 a month. And if you get enough of those, you could uh, in theory live on it. And, and some people certainly do. Um, but I don't think um, it's, a, it's practical for most people, even if your open source project is uh, widely used and, and popular, um, it might not bring in enough sponsorship to, uh, to live on, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. And so I do think GitHub sponsors really is <clears throat> kind of that that done right. You know, mm -hmm. it's 
it's recurring it's automatic yeah it has a mm -hmm. a social signal benefit right like you can see who is sponsoring which projects and so if you're an organization right like you could say oh look our company sponsors mm -hmm. that project or whatever yeah it's, it's very well done actually I've got, I've got no um no problems with it. it's done um you can like I said you can contribute every month or you can contribute a, a one-off and you can get your name mentioned uh, on the project and the author of the project can offer various perks um so it's, yeah. i think it's um it's, it's nicely done the other one that i see really pro I, this might be the most popular one is take an open source thing <clears throat> and then take away help alleviate or completely solve the operational side of things mm. right you know for example we have mongodb and then they have atlas with which lets you push a button and manage your cluster automatically inside your own aws or azure account we've mm -hmm. got streamlit which just got acquired has a lot of similarities to what you're doing you know mm -hmm. it's like it's got an open source version you can create these dashboards it's really cool but then what how do you put them on the internet how do you maintain yeah. them right and then well guess what there's a a paid tier that just runs it in our cloud for you right so it seems yeah. like a really great um, really great path to proceed down for what you're doing here um yeah that's right um there's a, they, they've got a term for it it's called um open core <clears throat> so so you use okay. the, the open source part to to drive uh, adoption um and then you can use that to sell some <clears throat> related services which will just make life easier for businesses and things because um there's a long history of businesses making use of open source projects and, and making um, a lot of money out of it um, but they haven't really put that money in to the business. So if the people that are building and maintaining these open source projects can also build side businesses um, around the open source project, then everyone benefits because your your code gets maintained uh, for you know indefinite future, and uh, people can make a living from it. Yeah, if you would otherwise have to hire somebody mm. to manage a Kubernetes cluster or whatever. And instead, yeah. you can pay twenty dollars a month. Like that's a real good deal. Exactly, and you don't want to have to solve all these problems individually for everyone that uses it. It's it's actually far better for um, someone to solve it once and for all, or at least reduce the, the 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 footprint for you know maintenance. Yeah, and who else better to you know figure out how to put it in the cloud than the people who are creating it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to TUI as a service <laughs> to, to come on strong here. That's great. So maybe before we jump into the lessons learned, just tell people about what textual is and then <coughs> textual is, is built upon rich. So mm -hmm. give us the, the quick rundown on uh, take which order, whichever order you think is better to go first, right. rich or textual. Um, I think rich, um, I'll go in chronological order. Um, so I started Rich, um, gosh, it must be like um, three years now. And the, the idea of, was to be able to write uh, colored text, the terminal, in a nice, um, elegant way, and also be able to um, build on that with larger components. So we've got things like uh, tables, we've got um, progress bars, we've got log messages, uh, panels, all, all sorts of things. And they're all using the same... Uh, core rendering technology, which basically uh, takes your objects and then turns it into uh, ANSI codes and text. And uh, that got fairly popular, shall we say? I was surprised. I would at say. I would say so too. Is. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's in, um, it's in PIP now, which still blows me away because that means that um, virtually every Python developer is, is, is running my code, which um, also scares me just, just a little bit. Um, this is nuts, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, if, if you have Python, you have pip, so you have have rich. Is it, mm. is it uh, packaged with pip as a dependency, or is it vendored in? It's it's vendored because you've got a uh, you've got a chicken and egg problem with with right. pip. Because um, pip is how you get the things, right? Exactly, exactly. So everything is vendored. Pip is just one project, um, with lots of uh, vendored uh, projects inside of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Fantastic. So rich. Yeah, for for people who haven't seen it in action, it's not just 
like um, Colorama or something, which I'm a big fan of Colorama, mm-hmm. but that's just about how do I make this line, this color or whatever. But you're talking about like <laughs> yeah. tables with auto, you know, auto ellipsing and all mm-hmm. sorts of really, really powerful content, right? Yeah, and, and some things which um, you might take for granted in the browser, like text wrapping, um, that wasn't easy to do prior to Rich. <laughs> um, it's more complex than you might you might think. Uh, things like um, emoji and Chinese characters, um, those take up two cells in the terminal. If you use the built-in text wrap module, uh, that won't account for that, and your text wrapping will be uh, misaligned. Um, okay. So I wanted to, to solve those kind of problems i just want it to be effortless you know i just you just say uh, print this text and it'll wrap it for you which generally makes it um a lot more readable yeah so, absolutely yeah. so there's a lot there's a I, lot going on there <laughs> i would say so mm. and i i don't know how many projects are using rich now but it's there constantly seems to be like and now this has rich support so it has yeah. a much better yeah you know, output or it's more understandable or whatever, right? A lot, a lot of cool things uh, happen. Yeah, so. and I, I'm, I'm delighted every time um, I read one of those. Um, <laughs> I, I do try to make it quite easy to to drop things in. For instance, um, if you're printing out Python data structures, you can use a, a rich method and you'll get uh, pretty printing and colorizing built in. Um, and things like uh, exception handling, we've got very pretty... Uh, exceptions that show you snippets of code and can you know highlight the the line where the error occurred um mm-hmm. and you can add those with just a few lines so i think that's that's kind of pushing adoption is the fact that there is very low barrier to entry yeah and it's just beautiful right it's easy to make beautiful uis mm. and if you make it easy for people to make nice looking things they they want to use it i mean it's yeah. not as used as much these days, but think of when Bootstrap came on the scene, mm-hmm. you know, eight years ago or ten years, whatever it was, ten years ago. Every everything started to look like Bootstrap because you could yeah. just apply this magic and like, oh, everything looks like professional, but we're not professional. And I feel like Rich is a little bit like that for two E's. Yeah, I I, I think so because it was um it's very difficult to add pretty formatting prior to Rich. I mean there were. Uh, libraries that existed, but they didn't integrate very well. Uh, mm-hmm. Rich kind of c- combines all of that functionality together, um, so it's it's very easy to to add uh, pretty content. And um, it's not just pretty for pretty's sake. You know, um, pretty can also mean more readable. Um, you know, right. developers we get presented with pages and pages of content that we learn to decipher and, and pick out meaning. Um, yeah, but we can do that much quicker if there's been some forethought into into how it's presented and rendered in the terminal and rich does give you that capability yeah absolutely um uh, jamie on the audience says i love rich rich traceback is so helpful maybe just quickly touch mm-hmm. on on the traceback and then also uh demetrius is asking about you know is this for jupiter is it only a thing for linux terminals and you know maybe sort of touch yeah. on those two things and we'll we'll talk textual um, tracebacks, yeah, you can install a traceback handler and it will capture um, unhandled tracebacks and present them nicely uh, in the terminal. Um, yeah. What was the other question? Sorry. <laughs> uh, what, where does this apply? Like, can I use this on Windows? Can I use it on Mac? Is oh. it for Jupyter? What is this? Um, pr- pretty much everywhere. So you can use it on all the major platforms, uh, Linux, Mac, uh, and Windows. And yes, it does work in, in Jupyter. So it'll convert the uh, ANSI codes to uh, HTML uh, automatically. That's not actually the most Jupiter. impressive thing to me. Yeah. Uh, that must be a lot of work to maintain all these different output destinations. And um, um, The terminal is not too bad. So Mac OS and Linux are, are frankly the same as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Um, Windows has a number of uh, tweaks and hacks because we have this, this two windows basically um, newer Windows has virtual terminal sequences which make it just like the Linux and Mac terminal and that that's terrific um, but we also support the uh, older style terminal which is um, is quite limited and there are a few right, right. Like, the cmd.exe is is not yeah. nearly as powerful as the no, terminal. 
is no. Um, so we have, we have to make um, some compromises and some uh, sacrifices. Um, it works. Um, it's, it's usable. It won't look quite as pretty. Um, but there's a lot of people using that out there, so it's important to maintain. Yeah, you can't really drop it. Yeah. No, no, you can't drop it. Okay, so and then the other thing that's more directly related to your article and to your business, although obviously one's a building block, so hmm. all same. Uh, it's textual. Yeah. So um, Rich was for writing kind of static content into your kind of terminal, your scroll back buffer. Um, what Textual does is it uses Rich, um, but it completely takes over your terminal to create a, an application. Um, you don't see a command prompt, but um, Textual will handle um, key presses and mouse movements, and it'll render um, quite sophisticated applications, which look more like uh, web apps than the previous generation of TUIs. Yeah. But under the hood, it's using the same code uh, that renders tables in Rich is it's kind of a, I call it a rendering engine. It's designed to take um, sort of abstract data and then turn it into um, what I call segments, which are basically a piece of text with a style. It's pretty amazing. You know, if you look at the UI, it's got, <laughs> it really does feel a bit like a web app. It has say like a, a title bar across the top. And, you know, this isn't just like text you printed out on <laughs> the top of the output. No. It's, yeah. It's stuck to the top like a nav bar, I guess, is the right uh, word. Then you have these different widgets you can put in line, like code highlighting. You've got uh, text widgets with like scrolling within scrolling. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got animated sidebars that pop out. All, all these cool different aspects, right? Even a uh, hotkey mm -hmm. support for like D to toggle dark and light mode if you want. Yeah. Yeah. We even got them. Um... Data tables now, which are pretty cool. They look kind of like um, little Excel windows type of spreadsheets, which oh, fantastic, yeah. Data in. Um, so it, it's um, I think my background is as a web developer, basically. Um, so I want to make something which um, anyone who knows how to use the web, which is yeah. pretty much everyone, uh, they would be comfortable using one of these applications. Um, you could just sit them down in front of it and they'll know exactly what to do. They'll know that um, this is a menu, they can click that. Here's a scroll bar, they'll know how to use a scroll bar. Yeah. Um, it'll work with a mouse wheel or, or two fingered uh, scroll on a trackpad. Um, it'll just be very, very familiar. Um, but at the same time, I also want to keep it um, keyboard focused because one of, the, one of the benefits of TUI is it doesn't interrupt your, your flow. Um, you know, you can be at the terminal typing commands, enter into a TUI, um, and you could work with that and use the keyboard and you can drop back straight into the command line. So yeah. it's, it's kind of this um, this marriage of the command line and more sophisticated um, applications which work um, a lot like desktop and web. Yeah. Previously, when people wanted to create apps like this, <clears throat> well, one, it was very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But if they wanted to come somewhat close to the type, these types of things, they would use a library called Curses or something like that, right? Yeah, and, and Curses has been around uh, for a long time, I think decades. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think um, from the 90s it, it came around. And you know, people have done some very cool fit things with it. And there have been like attempts to uh, improve upon it, but I think still it, it does take. Um, you have to be very well motivated to create um, an application with curses because you're going to have to deal with some uh, quite ar archaic issues. Yeah, um, I haven't done a ton with it, but it feels to me like the equivalent of saying like textual versus curses would be like. You could either use something like Pi Game, where you can give some sprites and they can mm. move around the screen, or you could fire up OpenGL or DirectX or Metal, and you could start rendering pixels <laughs> yeah. on your own. Like you could accomplish the same UI, but yeah. one is tremendously difficult. The other one kind of gives you much higher level building blocks to accomplish the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So a textual is more abstract. Um, you don't have to plot individual characters. Um, you just say, uh, put a text box in this part of the screen and a button in this part of the screen and, you know, textual handles the rest. So it's, it's less, um, less ar ar archaic, um, you know, aspects of terminals that go back um, decades yeah. that you have to think about. 
let the framework handle it and handle the differences, right? Yeah, exactly. That's 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 what computing should be. It should make make your life easier. You shouldn't have to think about um, yeah, you know, decades old. You know, you of- hear in, in science people talking about you know standing on the shoulders of giants of like building on Einstein and whatever. There's nothing else that stands on the shoulders of previous work like software, <laughs> right? It's just yeah. like layers and layers and layers of. We don't have to think about that anymore. We now have a, a different set of concepts to think in. Now let's go build, you know? Yeah, yeah, which is which is fine for the most part, um, as long as you don't ever have to look behind the curtain. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the same with um, yep. in any piece of computing. Um, it presents a nice, clean interface, um, but there's a lot of effort to get there. It's like a uh, like an iceberg. You only see the very tip of it, but two-thirds are like below the water level. Yeah, absolutely. That's, <laughs> if you have to, if basically, if it becomes a leaky abstraction, mm. right, and then you've got to deal with the underlying layer, but not exactly. Anyway, exactly. All right. Last question, and then we'll we'll move off. Um, uh, talk about the lessons. Luca asks, "Will Textual have a polyfill for, <laughs> for Blink, uh-huh. like manual?" Uh, <laughs> text blinking and terminals which don't support it or, or you know but basically i guess more interesting does it have polyfills and, and like other ways to make stuff happen that's not naturally supported yeah um you know it could quite easily um you could set up a, a timer you call set interval which would toggle um something to show the, the blink or, or hide the blink um I don't think I want to support in textual because I don't want textual apps to be blinking. It's it's a terrible <laughs> user interface for the most part. Um, the exception would be uh, a cursor. Sometimes you want a cursor to flash so you can see yeah. where it is. Um, I think I might leave that one um, up to the developer to implement, and it probably is like a two line job. I I can see a future where some movie has like a fake hacker UI. Mm. implemented and textual and they probably have a blink thing about like when something's going to blow up going on all right let's move on let's go to your lessons so Mm -hmm. this this is what you've been building what you are building and obviously you've worked on rich for a long time you've worked you and your colleagues at the company for a year now so tell us about the lessons let's go through these Mm. yeah okay so um Terminals are fast. Um, this might surprise people, and I can understand why. It surprised me. Yeah, because yeah. when, when you use a terminal, you, you type a few characters, and the characters appear on screen. You, you hit return. Um, you know, half a second later, you'll get a response with some text. And you don't think of terminals as being fast, um, but nowadays they're built on the same technology that runs video games. So it uses the, the GPU to to update the, the terminal with... Uh, with new characters which have a, a background and a foreground. And it turns out that you can, um, if you can write updates at 60 frames a second from the Python code, uh, the terminal will happily display it. Um, I, I was surprised at, at how smooth it was. Um, we had 60 frames per second animation of something moving across the screen, and it looked uh, silky smooth. And that was updating the entire screen, like uh, every every frame. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm really impressed with the fact that so many of these uh, terminals are hardware accelerated, like GPU accelerated. And I'm mm-hmm. just poking around. Um, what am I running here right now? I'm running iTerm. And it has all these settings for GPU render redraws um, and basically the maximum frame rate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so uh, things like this, it's just, yeah. it's you would never expect to go find hardware acceleration features inside the terminals, but they have them. Mm-hmm. They, they do, yeah. Them. And um, it's quite strange because not much software takes advantage of that. I mean, um, your day-to-day work at the terminal, um, it doesn't need to be fast. It really doesn't. Um, as long as it can add new data you know, in within a second, you're probably quite happy. So these terminals... Um, have been getting faster and faster and faster. And some of them, like um, I use Kitty and something called Westerm, and those are incredibly wow. fast. They're really optimized at, at getting things uh, on the screen. But then most software, 
yes, it, it, Kitty is excellent. It's, it's super fast. But most software doesn't need it. You know, it's like um, you use you use um, Vim or or HTOP. HTOP updates once a second. Um, yeah. So it's like the developers of these terminals are making it faster and faster and faster. Um, but there's very little software that makes use of it, um, except for like um, sort of hobbyist demos where they do like video to to text things. So you can see like your face that's made up with uh, with ASCII characters, which, which is fun. Right. <laughs> um, but you don't think that's not really productivity software. So I was, I was very pleased that when I started working uh, on textual that um, it wasn't a bottleneck. You know, I, I, I could if I could write things fast enough to the terminal, the terminal would happily accept it and, and render it. Yeah. So that opens, I mean, you know, that opens the possibility for so many things. If you can get high frame rates, you know, and mm. the, the I term default was limit frames to 60 frames a second, right? 60 mm -hmm. frame a second. That's, that's plenty fine for really smooth animations. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I think it's probably what my LCD monitor is stuck at. Right. So that's, that's as fast as you're going to see it basically anyway. That's it. And um, it can't, um, there's not much use in it being uh, any faster because in order to see greater than 60 frames a second, you have to have something that's moving at greater than 60 frames a second. And generally, um, you don't want things um, flying about your, your terminal um, unless maybe you're making a, a video game. Um, we use animation quite sparingly um, for for nice kind of things like uh, when a panel slides in the sidebar pops in um it's it's quite smooth uh we can also use it for uh, fades so we can set the opacity yeah. of a block of text and have it uh, fade away and, and fade in again and that's sometimes quite useful if you want to draw the uh, user's attention to the fact that you've added a new item um rather than having it right. appear immediately it'll, it'll fade in um so we can use animation uh, in those places um but again it doesn't need need to be anywhere near 60 frames a second no it doesn't have to but i do agree that little bits of animation are super <clears throat> important for making mm. for highlighting things that people need to pay attention to without mm -hmm. much effort and it doesn't have to be so bright colored or right in the right in the way right if you just have a yeah. little thing slide down that says you know this job has finished while the other yeah, work exactly. is happening or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. And you yeah. have a video here on this article, the seven things article that we'll link to, uh, obviously. And it shows uh, you running this thing called basic pie. Is this included with textual or is it? Um, is yeah, it, that, uh, that's one, that's uh, one of our sandbox apps. So whenever we're testing something, we just put it in basic.py. Um, so yeah. it shows off like a number of the, the features we've got. Um, I think that video is quite old. We've got some more cool stuff. Um, I'm, sure, but, I'm sure you do. Yeah. But one of the things that's really nice is it shows uh, a lot of the animations. And one mm. of the animations is changing the theme. Mm. Another one is to pop out the side navigation. Mm -hmm. And those are really nice, right? The fact that that happens at a frame rate fast enough that yeah. it looks completely smooth means it doesn't just look like some terminal app where a thing clicks in and then it clicks out it actually feels really you know really nice and polished yeah yeah um we've kind of identified there's, there's like a sliding scale of of animation um at one end you've got like the scroll bars um, it might not be obvious but those animate so if you click um below it it'll scroll smoothly downwards and also it'll filter when you click and drag it'll filter sort of um frames between uh, the motion of the mouse and it, it makes the yeah. scrolling look a lot more smooth um so that's not obvious but that is a use of animation and, and at that end of the scale i think most people would agree um that's that's good that that's a bonus at the other end of the scale we've got well, things which um are a bit gratuitous like um the sidebar um i like it but some people might think i i, I don't want to be distracted by this animation i just want it to uh, appear instantly i want it to be mm -hmm. more feel more snappy rather than animated so I think what we're going to do is we're going to have like a, a switch where you can decide as a user uh, what kind of animation you like. Um, if you just want the um, scroll bars, you can set it to be quite low and that would make the sidebar pop in instantly and disappear instantly. 
Um, but if you love the animation, you can just whack it up to the to the maximum, and then it will use <laughs> animation wherever it can for fading and sliding, etc. Fantastic. So, for example, with a scroll bar, <clears throat> that's not actually the terminal scrolling it. That's textual redrawing the screen and reprocessing it. Mm. If it's not smooth, if it just goes clunk, 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 mm -hmm. it's super hard to track yeah. when I scroll down where do I continue from and and, exactly. and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. It's it's not just there to make it feel good or feel smooth. It really it's not it just has important eye candy. Effects. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, you go exactly. if you press the page down, um if it was to jump down instantly, um you wouldn't be able to find your place in the text again. <clears throat> your your eye would just um would have to like focus in to find where you're reading. Uh, but if it scrolls and it, in over say 300 milliseconds um, your eye tends to follow um, where you were reading um, so you, you move your eye you follow the animation and then you're sort of reading again from the top and that's actually uh, beneficial it's not just eye candy it's, it's not just uh, gratuitous use of um, of a feature you know yeah absolutely it's very very helpful so you talked about all of this happening without flickering in the terminal mm. and we already discussed the GPU accelerated, hardware accelerated aspects, but you said also that's not necessarily enough. So there's a couple of tricks that you highlight here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the the um, the protocol um, of terminals was, was came about over many decades, and it wasn't designed to avoid flickering. I think when people Built the they never imagined what you would be trying to do with it. <laughs> no, they didn't think someone was going to be animating it at 60 frames a second. Um, so there's no, uh, well, there's, there's very little help to, to reduce flicker. Um, so there's a few things that you can do. Um, one I've discovered is it's better to um, overwrite content um, without clearing it. So if you want to animate, um, say, a piece of text, make it move, uh, you might think, I'll clear this text and then I'll draw on top of it. Um, but what that does is it'll introduce a potential for a frame where you see the where it's cleared, and then you see the frame where it's updated, uh, and that'll cause yeah. flicker. Um, so if you just overwrite the content without clearing it, then that reduces the the chance of flickering. Yeah, I've and also that, seen sometimes yeah. some of these like progress bars or the like little tables updating. They seem to write new whole sections, and it's like filling your your history mm. with with every frame. You know, your your terminal history is like full of every frame and, and stuff like that. If you yeah. like start to resize it, and there's all this weird stuff that happens if you're mm. not actually overriding it. Well, um, textual goes into what's called application mode. Uh, this is a this is a feature of terminals. Um, so when you're in application mode, you don't have a scroll back buffer. Um, ah. the, the scroll back buffer has that problem it, it'll tend to fill up uh, with garbage if you're trying to animate animate things and it's also right. quicker because the terminal doesn't have to worry about appending data and and moving it etc so so textual goes into um uh application mode and it's, it's generally right. much faster and um able to reduce that flickering trick yeah, two so the trick two um <clears throat> so one of the problems um, with the protocol uh, is that it does, it's not aware of, of flickering. It doesn't know when to paint the screen. So you're sending it data. It needs to know uh, when to update the screen. Um, if you write lots of small pieces of data, say you're going to update a character over here, you're going to update a progress bar here, um, it might update a few of them and then paint the screen and then update some others and paint the screen. And it's that brief moment where you've got half an update um, which is what causes flicker. Um, so what I've discovered is if you batch all your updates into one write, so you, you just write standard output the once um, rather than you know several writes, um, that will reduce the potential uh, of flicker quite a bit. Interesting. Mm. I, of course it would, and I've never really thought about it. Uh, when you're doing regular pixel-based graphics programming, you know, OpenGL, DirectX, those types of things, mm. they often set up what's called a double buffered mode mm. where you actually draw the screen on like a hidden piece and then you swap that to be in one like V-Sync to be the screen so you don't see like the pieces 
streaming yeah. in as it goes. And this is the same yeah. equivalent thing for terminals, huh? It's like double it's, buffered. You write to it like a whole thing and then you make it the screen. It's, it's a very similar concept. Um, the terminal doesn't give you that. <clears throat> it doesn't have uh, an invisible buffer that you can take your time to, to draw to. Um, so you have to implement that yourself. Um, but yeah, essentially we're implementing a, a double buffer. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Mm. And the third one is has to do with synchronized output. Yeah, <clears throat> um, so doing the, the one right thing, that's very helpful, but there's also um, a fairly recent addition to the protocol, um, which helps with this. Basically, you write uh, an escape code where it says, I'm beginning an update, and then you write your data, and then you write another escape code which says, I've finished the update. And but between those, those two escape codes, the terminal won't update. It only update at the very last moment. Um, so that's kind of accomplishing the same thing um, as the double buffer, <clears throat> but there's, mm -hmm. there's protocol yeah, support similar, for yeah. it. Um, so we do both yeah. because not all terminals uh, support these new escape codes. So by doing both, we can ensure that um, it's you know flicker free on newer terminals and older terminals. Yeah, fantastic. Speaking of uh, different terminals, Kim in the audience asks, is application mode that you talked about earlier with the buffer mm -hmm. uh, a universal across all the terminals? Uh, it is, yeah. It's, it's been around for a long time. If you've used HTOP or anything like it or a full screen terminal app, um, that'll use application mode. Yeah. Uh, final question while we're on this performance thing. You know, when will we see Doom implemented? <laughs> um, people keep asking that. I, I don't know. It might it might happen. I think it has to happen. I mean, Doom runs virtually <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It Maybe does. the first Doom. Maybe not Doom Eternal. Yeah, yeah. Now we're mm. thinking the original Doom that really was was amazing. Right after Castle Wolfenstein. Very good stuff. Yeah, yeah I love this. All right. So mm. that was all some really interesting stuff about terminals, but you also have some other. Uh, recommendations and discoveries that are mm. pretty awesome, even if you're doing other types of programming. And one of them is dict views. Yeah. Apparently, I used dict views a lot, but I didn't really know they had a special name. Tell us what are dict views and then why are they useful? Um, so, dict views are the object returned <clears throat> from a dictionary when you call um, items or, or keys. And I think almost all you know Python developers have used this, but we tend to use them. Uh, to iterate over to get the keys and the items. Uh, what you might not know is these are, are special objects. They're not just simple iterables. And they act a lot like sets, um, which kind of makes sense. Because if you've got a, a dictionary, um, the keys are all unique. So you, you can't have a repeating key. So if you've got a key view, right. um, it's set like, which means you can do uh, set like operations on it. And right. you know, ask the quick question like, is this thing I'm about to add in here or not? Something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you can take two different, you can take a set and, and a key view and combine them and see the, the intersection, see what keys are common in both um, or neither. And th those type of operations um, turned out to be very useful for what I was using it for. And to be honest, I think this might be the first time I've ever use that in anger it's one of the things that you read about in the notes for the latest python and you think i can't imagine i'll ever use that and yeah um, and i didn't for for years but then uh, i had a problem um where in in textual when we do a new update via css we've got two different data structures one with the old positions of things and then one with the new positions of things and what we want to do is, is compare those two data structures and find the things uh, which have moved or have changed size. <clears throat> and I started writing code for this, and it wasn't straightforward code. It was, you know, it was a couple of hours in. I had written a lot of code, and I was thinking, oh, that's a bit too slow. It's a bit too awkward. And only then did I, did I remember the, the fact that you could use these key views um, as set operations. And yeah, the code amazing. turned out to be almost a one-liner. And... You know, I was so happy about this. Um, I forget forgot the fact and spent two hours writing code <laughs> that I would just deleted. Let me give people an example here who are listening. So, if you check out the blog post, there's a nice code example. And you know, the UI of Textual is made up of all these widgets. They've got names like header, footer, and sidebar, and they have boundaries and regions, rectangles. 
And as the UI changes, you might only want to redraw the delta, not the whole thing for performance reason, right? Mm -hmm. And so given the old view and the new view, the question is, well, what widgets have changed? And so you just say render map dot items, uh, caret for symmetric difference with the uh, other, the newer, newer frame dot items. And, mm -hmm. and that tells you these are the pieces that have to be redrawn, right? Yeah, uh, that gets exactly the information needed. It that tells me um, which things are new, um, which things have been removed, and then which things have changed position. And th those three types of things are the things that I need to redraw on the screen. And you know, it's it's a one liner, and I get I get that information um, for free because it is very fast. It's, it runs in uh, at the sea level and, and produces just information that I needed. Yeah. It, th honestly, this surprises me that this is possible. Hmm. I would totally <clears throat> expect that with dot keys because keys have to be set like. Mm -hmm. But items, you could have the same item assigned to different keys all over the place and stuff. So it's, um, it's a little interesting well, here. The item is, is you know, obviously the, the key plus the value. Um, so together, they're unique. The values are not unique. Oh, I see. That's right, because that's a tuple of the yeah. key. I see. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So that the keys and are guaranteed then, to be unique, therefore. Sense. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. therefore, yeah, the, whatever you add to it, it's, it's not going to mm. make it less unique by adding <laughs> stuff, <laughs> more possible differences. All right, so uh, not totally related to this, but I got to ask it because it's just so meta. Add a, uh, Andrew out in the audience asks, can you embed a terminal within a textual app? Um, I can't, I've been asked this a few times. I'm just, I'm wondering what people want to use this for, but um, in, in theory, it should be possible. Um, it means I'd have to write um, a software layer which interpreted all the escape codes and then translated that to like a region of, the t of a textual app. Um, but in theory, uh, yes, it's possible. Uh, will we do it? Maybe one day. <laughs> it's not the, the highest on the priority, but maybe. Yeah, maybe. Okay, very interesting. Is there something like a textual.contrib you know, these these yeah. extras that people put in, like there's Django contrib and there's other contribs. Yeah, not not currently, but I'm I'm really hoping that the community takes it and starts building things. So you could search PyPy for textual underscore and then get lots yeah. of widget libraries and various add-ons. Um, I absolutely is there want like a to plugin or extension aspect? Anything well, official the, like that? Yes, there's. So the widgets um are, are designed to be built that way. You can. Uh, widgets are like um, independent uh, portions of the screen that can handle events and things and updates. Uh, and th those are can be bundled up into separate libraries, third-party libraries. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be the easiest way to implement something. You could uh, implement a, I don't know, anything you wish, like a full IDE if you wanted to, mm -hmm. and just um, import it as a, as a Python library. Sure. All right. Uh, related to using dict views for speed, it's really hard to beat caching for speed, isn't it? Yeah, caching is awesome, and, and it's one of the things which allows textual to be uh, fast. Um, so LRU cache, um, I think a lot of people have used it, but maybe not appreciated how fast it is. Um, <clears throat> the caching and generating the key is done at the C level, um, so it's super fast, and you can use it for quite small functions. We've got a lot of calculations which um, are pretty quick, you know, they're, they're well under millisecond, they're like fractions of a millisecond. Mm -hmm. um, but we do them a lot of times. So we might do them like 10,000 times. Um, but if we introduce the LRU cache, um, the, the time it takes to do those function calls becomes the time it takes to essentially do a, a dictionary lookup. And then they become very fast. So that, that, can, uh, that led to quite surprising speed ups. Yeah. Uh, so you have an example here that you talk about where um, you're given um, a couple of regions and you do the intersection of those two, mm -hmm. right? Um, a region being like a rectangle like thing. Yeah. So you've yeah. got to figure out, well, which is the top leftmost and like all those, there's a bunch of comparisons to find the overlapping rectangle if it exists right yeah and then, so it's, it's yeah. not um it's not very complicated it's not very slow um it's just doing sort of arithmetic and it's working on local variables that's generally the fastest kind of code you can expect from python um yeah you also you create um 
a uh, region object which has to reserve some memory. But if you put the LRU cache on it, um, that becomes a dick lookup, so it becomes very fast. And the type of um, you know calculations we're doing, we tend we often do the, the same ones many many times. So we we'll use the same two two values to find the intersection. Like that, the first time you update the screen, you calculate some intersections, and then the second time maybe one or two items is moved. Um, but most of the same calculations are done again. Um, so LRU cache ensures that you don't do those calculations again. You just pick them out of a dictionary, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, big wins. And it's so easy. So you know, just copy that one line, and everything works. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, it's kind of related to what we're going to get to here, but this kind of code is fantastic because, in terms of caching, because it doesn't really depend on something that could change behind the scenes. It doesn't have hold of like weird pointers that other, you know, could could change in other ways. Yep. And so it's it's very very deterministic. It's going to give you the mm -hmm. same answer every time. And yep. You know, it's it's not like the cache is going to get weirdly stale, right? Yeah, it, exactly. So it's um it's an immutable object. Um, I think uh, region is actually a named name tuple, and you get you get all those benefits. There's no side effects. Um, you, you can write these functions that have got an input and an output, um, and it doesn't depend on any other state. And when you have that kind of function, I think they call it a pure function. Um, is mm -hmm. caching works beautifully. Um, there's no there's no hidden surprises, and it also I think makes your code more easy to read reason about because <clears throat> you you can trace it you know just just manually you, you can tell what's going on just by looking at one function um, you you can see the the full story um, so sure. yeah immutable objects um, if your code can use immutable objects I think you, sh you should favor it um, it doesn't always make sense but um, immutable is definitely best. Yeah, definitely easy to reason about. Mm. Kim at, in the audience says, presumably the memory cost of caching many frequently called functions isn't a big issue on a reasonable machine. And yeah. maybe, maybe it's yeah. worth pointing out the max size parameter you pass to the LRU cache. That's right. So you set um, a maximum size, and if you add more items than that, it'll throw out the oldest one. Um, so you can you can define the set, the maximum size that you will record. And it depends on how you use it. Um, if you're, you have tend to have like a, a, a common set of calculations which you're doing uh, repeatedly, and, and those will kind of be in the cache most of the time. And then you might have some calculations which happen infrequently, you know, combinations of, in, of uh, input and output. Um, and then you, those get recalculated occasionally, um, but it's still a big win. And yeah. uh, for a put, 4096 items for that the region's name tuple is quite small um so that keeps the memory usage to something reasonable yeah very cool i did want to highlight this project um called async cache because i think i have to ch i haven't checked lately but i think the lru cache is only for synchronous functions i think so yeah yeah, I think so too. I, I mean, you know, maybe it's been upgraded. I haven't, I haven't checked. But let's just, if it has, if it's still true, uh, there's this project called Async Cache, which has nearly the same uh, UI, but applies to async functions. Mm -hmm. So basically, the decorator has to return a function, which is first checks the cache and then calls the function. Uh, for the async version, that has to be an async function returned out of the decorator. Uh, hence the the difference right mm -hmm. and so this async cache has something really similar where you can have a lru cache where you set the max size or you can also have a time to live like i only want these results to stick around for 60 seconds mm -hmm. um it also has a bunch of other interesting uh features that you can uh, bring in um like works on orm objects request objects a bunch of other things it has a um, like sort of custom support for custom types that are you know, one of the things that this this needs here is, I think it's hashable. I think you have hash have to have hashable arguments yeah. for LRU cache. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that that strikes me as something very useful. If you've got um, <laughs> yeah. a calculation which does some awaits, um, and you want to cache it, then yeah, that looks like a fantastic project. Yeah. 
not super popular. People can check it out, but it looks, <clears throat> looks pretty useful. Okay. We kind of touched on this already, so maybe we won't go too much into it, but just uh, one of the uh, the actual lessons you said is immutability is, is definitely a good thing. So we yeah. can get this from tuples, named tuples, which are like better tuples. <laughs> you know, you can address yeah. them by a name of variable type or frozen data classes. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to think uh, immutable first. Um, so I'll, I'll prefer to make my objects uh, immutable. And only when I think that's going to become a hindrance do I make them mutable. And uh, that's, I think, I uh, started doing that a few years ago, and I think that's benefited my code. So I'd recommend uh, mutable objects. Yeah. And then if you're out there doing semantic, which many of us are these days, has faux immutability, which is mm. kind of like it. <laughs> it takes a shot at making things immutable. And you could just say allow mutation false uh, as the config for your Pydantic model, which is mm. pretty fantastic. Yeah, I think Python doesn't support true immutability. Immutability. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if you really wanted to, you could do some horrible hack to change an object which should be uh, immutable. Um, but, you know, like Python's philosophy is we're, we're all adults here, right? So um, yeah. don't do crazy things like that. And even for languages that have like the word const and mm. stuff, it still doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It, there's a little bit of Monty Python going on. No, uh, Princess Bride sort of thing going on there where, okay, so this object says it can't be mutable and it has pointers to other objects. And so sure, you can't reassign those mm. pointers, but that thing points to something which points to something which internally you call a function which changes, you know what I mean? Like to get true immutability yeah. is super hard and super restrictive. So super hard, yeah. So yeah, Python yeah, yeah. isn't too bad in, in that respect. Um, it's definitely, definitely yeah. safer than, than C, C++, et cetera. <laughs> that's that's yeah. for sure. Okay, immutability is good. So is Unicode art. What the heck is this? Um, so in the, in the textual code, there's, there's quite a lot of um, functions like this, which are kind of geometric. So it might divide something into two. or, or Yeah, it's always doing like visual things, right? quite a lot of visual things. So here, here mm -hmm. we've got an example. Um, it was a function which uh, takes a region and splits it into four by making two, or making a horizontal and a vertical cut. Um, and that's quite hard to express in English succinctly. Uh, I mean, you can do it, but it'll take you like a big paragraph. Um, but if you create something like this, um, this kind of uh, Unicode art using um, various like box characters, you can draw uh, a, a diagram to show what you're doing and if you're coming to that code later um, that just makes it really obvious um, at a glance what it's doing uh, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan uh, of that kind of Unicode art and I use an application uh, called Monodraw which is Mac OS only but there are similar applications for uh, other platforms and uh, yeah I, I use it wherever I can also because it's it's kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> it is called cool. a powerful ASCII art editor designed for the Mac. Mm. I, it's it costs money, nine and ten dollars. I love that it has educational pricing, but it only costs ten dollars. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cool, but yeah, it's it's pretty neat. You can, it's I guess you have like little um, arrows and boxes, and just like you might draw with um, PowerPoint or key, mm. uh, Keynote or something like that, as like kind of your. Let me put together a visual graphic, but the yeah. output is ASCII art. Yeah, and it's it's kind of um like a vector graphic type thing. So if you draw a box, you can click in the box and drag it. Um, it's not like a, a bitmap. So I, <laughs> oh, I find that's it, fantastic. Yeah, it's 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 quite powerful. Um, I hope the authors made a fortune out of it, frankly, because uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the output like? You output to clipboard. <laughs> Yeah, you can uh, you can cut and paste it. You can output to the clipboard. You can write it to a text file. I usually yeah. cut and paste it directly into Python code. Yeah, of course. So that's really cool. It also made me think of something that's not exactly the same purpose, but uh, Balsamic. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with Balsamic, which is really great for developing UIs. I don't know if they have a gallery or something. We need some more graphics on this thing here. Yeah, I've used uh, Balsamic yeah, for a while. It's, it's been around for a long time, hasn't it? 
Oh, it's been around forever. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's it basically lets you create UIs that look almost like as if they were created <laughs> using yeah. ASCII art. Not quite, but you know, it's an interesting goal. I did also want to highlight the most useful piece of ASCII art. And to be clear, all of this discussion is what goes in the comments, right? What goes in the code <laughs> comments or the doc strings? Mm -hmm. Uh, the one for, uh, what is it, for the the object allocator in Python. So if you look in obmalloc.c in CPython, there's all this fairly intense looking code for like allocating memory when it's p particular CPython objects like a pi object or pi long or whatever, right? If you scroll down to the section here around, around line 777, it has a paragraph that says, an object allocator for Python. Here's an introduction to the layers of Python's memory architecture, et cetera. And instead of having an essay in here, it has this incredible graphic that that is like vertically aligned mm. and shows you, here's where we allocate things like integers and lists, and here's Python core non-object memory allocation, and here's how it relates down to the OS and to actual hardware. What do you think of this? That's pretty awesome. Um, a lot of respect to the author because I'm, I'm fairly sure they didn't use MonoDraw. I think they did that by hand with, you know, typing the characters <laughs> like and it. spaces and everything. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think this is really fantastic. I was trying to piece together, you know, I did a course on Python memory and I was trying to piece together like, well, how do I visually represent how it is described mm. that the memory works? And I'm like, well, let me go look in the source code. And I was looking at this like, there's that actual picture in here. This is amazing. <laughs> I can't believe it. So, yeah. so neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, if people need a concrete example of the type of stuff you're talking about, uh, here's one that's pretty close to home. Mm -hmm. We all use it every day and we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Cool. Fractions. I was always amazed at the fact that 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1 is not equal to 0.3. I, I, I learned that in the school and it was, but for some reason it's not. What do you think? Yeah, so this is um, a problem that goes, this is it's not just Python. Um, it's pretty much any language which uses floats and doubles, which is like almost all of them. Yeah. And it trips up beginners and experienced developers. Um, it tripped up me when I was working on Textual. We have lots of code which will divide the screen into various proportions. So you might have uh, a third and then a two thirds, and you might divide the height into sevenths. Um, and what I found was that when I used floats, I got a lot of rounding error. Not actually not a lot of rounding error, but occasional rounding error, which means uh, it wouldn't draw a line or it wouldn't draw a column uh, because this kind of issue where um, the rounding error is compounded and then it's been um, rounded down to the nearest character and right because you've got to you've got to talk in like little block pieces anyway and if it just misses it right if it then... just misses it by point zero 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 one then then you'll be a, a whole character out and i did come up with like various ways of solving this where i used uh, integers rather than floats and, and kept track of the uh, the error and um, which i think is the standard approach of doing it but it was quite tricky code and i'd get it wrong too frequently um, but then I remembered fractions um, so f fractions is they behave just like numbers but they start at life um, as a numerator and a denominator so you know fraction 1 comma 2 equals a half and the great thing about f fractions in the stand library is they don't suffer from that rounding error so if you have um, you know 3 1 tenths it'll add up to 3 tenths exactly with, with no no rounding error, and it makes um, it makes that kind of code, which I do a lot of in Textual, to be much simpler. Um, so I was very happy when I re-remembered it because I, I must have known years ago, um, and thought, why do I need fractions? You know, it's like yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> this is not elementary school. I don't need this. Come mm. on. <laughs> a lot of Python's like that. Point one. Yeah. yeah. So you learn that you think, well, that's probably useful to mathematicians or something or someone else yeah. not to me um but if you work long enough you'll eventually find a problem where that is actually the the perfect solution for it yeah i didn't know about these either i see comments in the audience as well like fractions what is this madness yeah. <laughs> um 
So you're telling us that you can only work in rational numbers, not you know irrational numbers like pi and e. We can't have can't have um, yeah columns uh, that are e wide. No, no, you can't. Or or, <laughs> or pi high. No, um, yeah. pi. It's pi by e. No, it's cut off. Darn it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, the, the cool, cool thing is that um, fractions you can drop in replacements to floats. So if you've written some code which um, was previously using floats. And then you pass in fractions, um, everything will work as normal, except you'll not get the rounding error. So it's really kind of beautiful. Okay. So you're saying the fraction library supports things like division, multiplication, addition, and basically would mm. duct typing behave the same? Yeah, it's duct typing is a, a, a rational number. Um, so anywhere where you use a float, uh, fractional work. Okay. Oh, I, I learned about that. Amazing. Let's see, emojis are hard. You talked a little bit about things that take up different sizes and Unicode and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when when I started uh, Textualize and um, I got my first employee, um, I thought this is a problem that I want to tackle because it has been bugging me for 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 two whole years. Uh, and the problem is basically this: that um, some characters will take up two cells in the terminal, they'll double wide, and some characters will take up one cell. And if you want to do any kind of formatting, say to draw a line or a panel around it, you need to know exactly how many cells a piece of text will, will take up. And it sounds like a simple problem. All you need to do is, is know how many cells a character will take up. So you might have a function which um, takes a character and returns either one or two. And in essence, that's what um, Rich does. But um, at some characters you can't know because they will render differently on different terminals or render differently on iTerm and, and Windows <laughs> um, and, and Linux. And it gets even more complicated. You can get multiple characters, so multiple, um, what's the, multiple code points in the character. So you might have something like a, like a flag and a flag has a, like a two letter character code and another character code which tells you this is a flag. Um, so if you iterate over that, you get three code points um so you have to know um first of all how how everything works together and there's, there's quite a lot of those type of characters um i can't imagine how tricky it is to be down inside unicode yeah yeah it's it's uh <laughs> it's crazy this is very very complex and you know we thought well we'll just do it we'll just apply some engineering effort and just um just do it but we discovered that it was impossible to know because you can't tell how the terminal is going to render these Unicode. It might do it correctly. It might actually render a single character. Um, yeah. If the terminal is not aware of multi-code point emojis, then you might get three characters. Um, right. they, they, they might render um, as nothing, or they might render as three double-width characters. Um, they might not even render properly, so they might, they might overlap the following character. And Some number was, of boxes. Yeah, it's just um, every terminal did it differently. Not only the terminal, it's, it was platform dependent. So if the terminal used the Unicode database on the operating system, um, then you'd get different results if, if it shipped its own copy of the Unicode database. And it just turned out it was, it was impossible to, to know how many characters. So, um, so what do you do? Well, th there's, there's a subset up to about Unicode 9 where things seem to be mostly sane, most terminal support. Um, so if you use those, those are fine. Um, but after that, it becomes unreliable. Um, if you have um, flags and multi-code point characters, um, then it might not work. It, it might cause um, the alignment of tables and panels to be out. You know, the, the end character might be shifted out by one. And it just comes up so frequently and I would solve it if I could. Um, but as <laughs> far as I can tell, there is no reasonable solution which will work across all right. platforms uh, and all too, too many uh, unknowns, right? Too many unknowns, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's a crazy thing, but it kind of makes sense because these Unicode characters came out in the last few years and operating systems and terminals um, haven't caught up and they haven't agreed <clears throat> on how to render them. So it's... Um, it's a frustrating situation, uh, but I'm sure that we are. it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at like some of the nerd fonts, for mm. example, 
uh, when I, you know, at nerdfonts.com, you know, you look at some of these, what is possible, I think here, you know, you have these like colored arrows and do they have, I don't know if, oh, if you go over to, um, oh my posh, which I don't really have time to talk about, but if you look at the themes that are in here, the different mm. themes that you can pick and just some of the effects, like a character that looks like a git branch <laughs> with an arrow in it. Like, yeah. how is that? <laughs> how are you supposed to decide how big that is? Or, you know, how is some of this, this stuff accomplished? It's just, yeah. I, I don't know how they represent those characters. I wonder if they reuse existing characters. Um, I, when I saw that, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is, I don't know how this is possible. Mm. Right. Rounded edges and all sorts of stuff. So I'm like trying to find one where it's like a, a sparkly fade from one character to the next. It's these, these things over in the, Oh, my posh dot dev themes. If I thought about your job to figure out like, what is that supposed to look like? I don't know. Mm. I would just give up because <laughs> <laughs> these are, I mean, they're really impressive and really useful, but they're mm. this one, for example, the cert theme where it's got like little dots that fade from one to the next. I just, I just don't mm -hmm. know. Amazing. But does look pretty cool. How, how are you supposed to know, right? Right. <laughs> cool. All right. So those are your lessons. Very, very cool stuff. I'm really appreciate you coming on to talk about the the seven lessons. You know, terminals are fast. Dict views are amazing. LRU cache is fast. Immutable is good. Unicode R is good. Fractions are good. Emojis bad. <laughs> Does that summarize it? <laughs> that, that about yeah, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, let's let's wrap it up with one more thing real quick here. Um, let me see if I can find it. This one, there we go. So, one of the sort of bring it full circle back around. One of the cool things to to make terminals nicer that you've talked about recently is rich dash CLI. You want to mm -hmm. close out the show? Or just give us tell us what rich CLI is. Sure. Okay. So um, as you know, Rich is a library and Rich CLI is a CLI interface for that library. Um, so most of what Rich can do is exposed by Rich CLI. So you can cat um, most file formats and it'll be nicely syntax highlighted and you'll have um, line numbers and, and, and guidelines and all sorts of things. And you can do things like um, uh, panels, you can format text. Um, what else? There's a whole bunch of other features. Um, I think we've got yeah, so for example, if I had a, a JSON document on, yeah. the, on the terminal, I could type, I could open it in some terminal-based editor, you know, think SSH somewhere, or I could I could just type more or cat the name of it, and it would uh, print out just plain text of whatever's on the inside. Or now I could type rich, mm -hmm. the file name, and I get, you know, highlighted, colorized formatted content for like csv and json and all mm -hmm. those kind of things right yeah yeah so um the, the rich the uh, json example is quite good because that will um decode the json so if you've got like um compressed json with no white space it makes it impossible to read um rich will um decode it and it'll also format it and uh, i see like pretty prints it. it pretty prints it exactly okay yeah and um it'll do uh, markdown it'll do a reasonable job of rendering markdown and it'll take uh, CSV files and it'll turn those into nice rich tables and uh, if, if your output is quite large you can add hyphen hyphen pager and that'll uh, put in a nice pager where you can scroll up and down with, with scroll bars and do page up page down etc so it's, it's kind of like a, a toolbox for um, fancy rich formatting of all sorts of different data types yeah Definitely a cool project. And I know you're concerned about emojis, but Paul in the audience says, fortunately, Doom does not require emojis. So it's still on the table. I suppose not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, fantastic lessons. Thanks for sharing all of your experience. Uh, final two questions before you get out of here. If you're going to write some Python code, work on Rich, what editor are you using these days? It's not so uh, meta that you're using Textual to write Textual yet, is it? No, maybe one day. Um, but no, I use VS Code, um, and uh, I, I quite like it. I'm comfortable with it. Um, my colleague mm -hmm. uses um, uh, what's the editor by JetBrains? Um, PyCharm. 
Pie Charm, um, and he's very proficient at Pie Charm. And to be honest with you, I am jealous of some of the features of Pie Charm. It does some really cool things. Um, so I'm kind of tempted to try Pie Charm. <laughs> looking over the shoulder awesome mm. yeah very cool and then notable pipi package i mean we've touched on some good ones that start or end with rich but uh anything else you you run across that you're like oh this is fantastic people should check this out um oh gosh uh there's so many it was i'm drawing a blank um i should have prepared one in advance how about one that you use that makes rich work well or something well, there's there's um prompt toolkit. Um, so I I owe prompt toolkit. I'm um, a big debt of gratitude, because when I was figuring out the the textual stuff, um, I I looked at the prompt toolkit source code, mm -hmm. um, which is a great thing about open source that you can look at other people's code, uh, and it is it is very good. It helped me understand things, and it still does things which um textual doesn't do yet. So I think prompt toolkit is an excellent project, and if you haven't used it, you should definitely check it out. Yeah, prompt toolkit's interesting. You'll be typing along, and all of a sudden, just there's like a, a combo drop down box, like mm. a select <laughs> right in the middle of your terminal, and then you just carry on. Yeah. Yeah, it makes things like, I think it's used in IPython. It makes that much, much nicer, much more friendly. Absolutely. Mm. All right. Well, final call to action people want to do stuff with rich textual, maybe take some of these lessons and run with them. What do you tell them, Will? Um, yeah, check out the website and um, check out my Twitter profile. And, and if you have any questions, feel free to ping them over to me. I'm always happy to talk to people about Python related things. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, I'll list to the link to the article with your list of topics there so people can check that out. Cool. Thank you so much for being here. It's been Thanks, great Michael. to catch up with you. Thank yeah. you. you Take bet. care. Bye. Bye bye.